Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm Jill Malcolm. I'm president of the Garden Club Federation of Massachusetts. Um, welcome to our annual program workshop. This morning, we have 19 experienced and entertaining speakers who will provide an overview of their programs and what they offer to garden clubs. Um, this program is being recorded and will be available on the GCFM website soon. Um, in addition, these and many other program providers have advertising on our website. Please be sure to visit gcfm.org for more information. Please address any questions directly to the speakers after the program. We will be forwarding their information, including their email addresses, to all of the attendees that registered. Um, we hope you enjoy today's program. Um, so thank you for listening to me do that little advertising. Um, I'm still admitting a few more people. Um, we will be, just this is for the presenters, we will be keeping very strictly to our uh, schedule. So I will give you um, a heads up when you are now over officially your time and ask you to wrap it up. Um, and we've allowed five minutes for each participant. All right, so we're a little bit on the earlier side, but Isabel Z, are you here? Uh, yes. Yeah. Are you Good ready morning. to go? Hello, Isabel. Are you ready to go? I am. Okay. We'll I'm take it away. This is slide. Isabel Z. So good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here this morning. My name is Isabelle Z from Les Bouquets du Grillon. I have been doing floral design for 15 years, and now I love to share my passion and my knowledge. Growing up, flower had been a language of love. I remember the tender moment when my father would offer flower to my mother. He either picked them up himself from the garden, the side road, or from the field, or just bought them from the supermarket. The joy of my mother while arranging them was the same. I'm French, I grew up in Africa and traveled with my husband quite a bit. But it is in Singapore that I developed that taste of creating with flowers. Everywhere you go, some artist has created masterpiece with a profusion of flower the island offer. That is where I took my first classes just for fun. We, we moved back to the US and with more time in my hand, I decided to create my own business. In order to be prepared, I went to France to learn from a renowned floral designer, Jean-Louis Yangswan. Between those different styles, I developed my own, of course. And I get excited to try new tactics. And here is some of my work. While I enjoy flower arranging in a vase, I also like to play with them, make them tell a story, give them a movement, a flow. Fol foliage is very important to me since it enhances the beauty of the flower star I had chosen. You can see here, the orchid look like they are landing on, on leaves. And the cluster of rose you see here with white lysenthus that look just like small roses. The job is just to soften the red of the arrangement. When I create this kind of arrangement, I feel like I am an architect. It is a structured design with line and direction. Every season I'm my favorite in terms of flower, but fall is very magic. The color are so rich and beautiful. We have so many reasons to want to decorate our houses. Simple hand tie bouquet like this are a win. A typical French bouquet you grab at the florist to offer to a friend. You can create display with autumn accessories such as pumpkin and succulent. Foliage and greenery are so important. They add so much to the design. They are considered to be neutral because they bring out the flower. You can shape them and, cre and create fun design like ribbons. I participated at the Art and Bloom at the MFA many years in a row with my garden club, the Sudbury Garden Club. And it is always a fun event to work on. And here are some examples of our interpretation. The last one being the last year. I offer two types of design, a demonstration and a hands one. 
demonstration. I usually pre-arrange one arrangement so people can see what we are going to work on. And then I demonstrate how to create. This helps to visualize how to get to the end product. Of course, while I demonstrating, I give tips on how to prep flowers so they last longer and I explain some techniques. We are all aware of the environment and why using Oasis is fun and allow you to create amazing design. I also give ideas on how to stay away from it. Like everything, it is practice and mostly enjoying doing it. A hands-on is a demonstration and then working on their own. I stay around to answer any question or guidance. I provide flowers, containers, and oasis if needed. Everyone go back home with their own creation. Please go to my website to check on my work. You will find more information and how to contact me, www.bouquetdugrillon.com. And thank you for listening to me. And I... Yeah, thank you, Isabel. Um, our next speaker is Rebecca Warner. So I'm Rebecca Warner. I'd like to talk to your garden club about ecological gardening. I know that lots of garden club members are looking for ways to put their environmental principles into practice in their gardens. Members tell me that they're planting for pollinators and growing more native plants. My three talks are about adjusting our approach so we can cooperate with natural processes and still have pretty gardens. My first talk is about some nitty gritty steps you can take to make your garden more earth friendly. I talk about really easy composting and making mulch from free materials you'll find close to home. I explain how you can pot up your container plants without using peat-based potting mix. That's because it turns out that harvesting peat is a major contributor to climate change. Coconut fiber is a solution for beautiful containers. And I toot the horn for no-till gardening. That's a technique that leaves the carbon in the ground and lets you skip the sore back when you're planting your annuals and vegetables. My second talk is about making gardens hospitable to native insects by growing more native plants. We know from Doug Tallamy and others that we need those native insects at the base of the food web if we're going to support biodiversity and a thriving garden ecosystem. I explain how you can promote a balance of the right insects for your yard. And I tell some truths about choosing the right native plants. I'm sure you've noticed that not every native plant grows effortlessly in every Massachusetts location. And I provide some ways you can tweak your gardening routine to make a home for pollinators and beneficial insects. My third talk tells how your lawn can reduce pollution and energy use, conserve water, and prevent stormwater runoff. All that by shrinking. I give some smart, attractive alternatives for part of that lawn. It's liberating to dig up some of that grass and replace it with more of the plants that you love. If you'd like to know more about my approach, please have a look at my book, The Sustainable Enough Garden. It's available on Amazon. Thank you and see you next year. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So let's do paint night. I'm with us, Ben. Trowel Garden Club, and we've done this several times as an activity. It's fun, it's economical, and it's good for all abilities, and everyone takes something home. So no matter what the ability is, and of course you always have people who say they can't do this or that, but when you give them a paintbrush and a model to follow, they have a great time, and they love their paintings when they take them home. We use acrylics 
they're easy, they're layerable, which I believe is a word, and washable, luckily. Um, and uh, if you don't like what you're doing, you just paint over it, right? So uh, that's the beauty of acrylics. So if I were to come to your club, you could choose a theme, a painting or picture or drawing to copy. Or if you just say you'd like to do a landscape, garden, flowers, or whimsical, I could choose um, a painting to copy, share it with you and, and decide on which um, item we would walk through um, to do paint night. It's economical because Spade and Travel um, purchased all these things uh, to do our own activities. So I have all the little individual easels, a zillion paintbrushes and some paints. And so they're very uh, cost effective to do these um, over and over again. So your club would buy canvases, um, which I have a little sample here of layers. There's like 10 for 1098. You can go to Michael's and depending on the size of your canvas, we went with um, 11 by 14. So they were larger, but you can get larger still or smaller or just small um, flat canvases. It's up to you. How would you like to do your painting and the size of it? And then the only the other thing we do is we use paper plates to put our little dabs of paint on to work from. You can see here in the photo that we have the easels up and we use uh, plastic cups uh, just for um, water changing um, colors um, and paper towels. So really quite cost effective. And the way we usually do this is um, I have an easel up front and I walk everyone through a painting uh, so that uh, of course, everyone individualizes their own, um, the way they approach their painting. So a little bit about me. Um, I usually have participated in uh, Art and Bloom. Here's a couple of, a uh, few of my um, Art and Bloom pieces here. I was trained in the fine arts. I never pursued it as a career, but I can do drawing, painting, and ceramics. And you should give it a try. There might be an undiscovered artist in your club. Um, we have a lot of fun with this. I was thinking of Paul Gauguin, who um, only went into painting after an entire career in a, as a stockbroker. Of course, we all can't check it all and go to the uh, Polynesia like Paul Gauguin did, but we can paint it. So you can call or text me, here's my phone number, or email me with natureartwithlisa at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Well, thank you. My name is Ed Burr. I'm with Bay Road Botanical, and we specialize in native edible and medicinal plant species. And we are offering three different programs as well as something a little unique. The first program is called Get Off My Lawn. Have you ever wondered why dandelions don't grow in the woods? Well, I did. And what I found out actually changed my life. Learn why weeds grow where they grow and why they keep coming back every year. Learn how knowing this information can help you grow what you want to grow in your yard. And lastly, learn some of the reasons or some of the uses for these weeds that we've done traditionally and untraditionally throughout the years. Second program is called Edible Forest Gardening for Urban Landscapes. Incorporating edible plants into our landscapes has become very popular over the last couple of years. Edible forest gardening is a large scale gardening technique. Learning those techniques and reducing them a little bit, we can incorporate them into urban and suburban landscapes to be able to create long-term sustainable gardens for ourselves and our families. And this program shows you how to do that. The third program that we're offering is plant communication. Science has finally caught up and realized that not only are plants sentient, but they also communicate. Learn how plants communicate with each other learn how plants communicate with their environment and learn how plants communicate with us. This is an exciting topic and a lot of fun. For something different, I also offer a walk with Ed at your place or mine, through the woods, your garden or a local park. I'll show you the local weeds and trees that are growing in your area and how they work together and their uses both economically, uh, edibly, and as well as medicinally. I can be reached both through email at ed at bayroadorganic.com. It's ed at bayroadorganic.com or on my cell phone at 617-216-4183. Again, it's 
1-800-216-4183. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ed. Um, speaker we have on the list is Karen Hawkinson. Yeah, and that's um, the Massachusetts Master Gardeners Association. Okay. Thanks. So is Karen or someone from Massachusetts Master Gardeners? Yep, I'm here. So as I've just said, I'm Karen Hawkinson. I'm the manager of the Speaker Bureau with the Massachusetts Master Gardener Association. And we supply speakers to your events as part of our mission to um, share horticultural best practices with the public. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. I'd like to give you five reasons that you might consider booking your lectures with us. So the first reason is our experience. We've been providing speakers for over 20 years, and we give approximately 100, 120 lectures and demonstrations every year. But I think the most important reason is our speakers. All of our speakers are certified master gardeners. They have years of experience. They've been doing hands-on gardening for years. Many have advanced horticultural degrees and many teach in our gardening boot camp and gardening know-how programs. And I just wanna mention, I'm not actually a speaker. I just manage the program, but I'm in awe of our speakers. The third reason is our wide range of topics. We offer over 40 topics in several different categories. We range from basic gardening techniques to edibles, to growing specific plant types, and then gardening issues and opportunities. We're always adding new topics, often at the request of people like you. And I just wanted to mention that right now we're in the midst of a new training class for speakers, helping them develop new presentations. And in a few months, some new presentations are going to be available from us. Several of them focus on water smart gardening, native plants, and inviting pollinators into your yard. So when these are ready, we'll put them on our website and we'll also advertise them in our newsletter that many of you receive, The Dirt. The fourth reason is that we're cost effective. We're a nonprofit, so we appreciate your need to manage costs. And finally, um, the, the last reason is that we offer an easy way to book a lecture. Um, our contracts include a one-hour lecture with time for question and answers. We do in-person and Zoom. And in order to book a lecture, all you have to do is get in touch with me and I handle all the checking with the speaker for availability and contracting. And if your event is open to the public, um, we will advertise in the DIRT, our newsletter and on our website. So thanks so much for this opportunity to let you know about our program and just contact me at speakers at massmastergardeners.org. So thanks. Thank you, Karen. Sounds interesting. We'll see the new ones this, this spring. So, um, hi, Mary Beth Hayes. I've been doing the speaker tour for a couple of years. I, I love doing them. I don't like driving places, but I love once I get there doing the um, doing the programs. So I have a few um, <clears throat> programs that I offer, and I'll briefly describe them, and then you can decide if you want to contact me and learn more. This is my dog Caroline, who sadly is no longer with us, but I, I can't quite give her up, so she's still in my pictures for a while. So one of the programs I offer is creating your own cutting garden which is a pretty marvelous thing to have. And I talk about how to set them up, what are easy things to grow, soil preparation, siting considerations, making it easy to maintain, which is kind of the key thing. But if you do set up your nice little cutting garden, you can see I have a bucket of spring flowers uh, and uh, the lower one shows a bucket of fall flowers. And if you set it up right, you can really enjoy Beautiful, beautiful flowers pretty much all season long. So talk about that. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of concern with using floral oasis these days because it's a, a single use petroleum based product. And some um, 
some organizations are banning using floral foam. So it's, it's actually quite a marvelous material, but it does have environmental downsides. So I talk about old and new alternative mechanics. So uh, the picture, who knows who's that lady in the left hand? If you know who that lady is, write it in the chat box. But she's using a vase filled with chicken wire, which is a great kind of mechanic for holding things in place. And the picture on the lower right is two ladies. I think it's from the Arlington Garden Club. And we used an Oshun choir pouch to make this arrangement. And their sweaters matched exactly. So I just, I kind of love that. So I include that photo. Uh, although there are some new green alternatives, I honestly think some aren't all that green. And we talk about kind of uh, environmental impacts of different products. But it's, I think it's important to look at all sides of these issues. Um, one of my most popular programs is Embellish Pumpkins, where we use these adorable mini pumpkins and, and we use flowers that dry nicely. And you don't cut into the pumpkin, so they last a very long time. And you can see ladies having fun sitting around making their pumpkins. I offer Whirlwind Tour of Begonias, which covers as house plants, as garden plants, how to take care of them, how not to kill them, how not to worry if you do kill them, what are good sources, um, all kinds of topics. It is, it is a, a wide ranging topic and I hope that something about it uh, inspires people to start growing some begonias. I have begonias flowering right now, cane begonias and rigor begonias. And what's flowering in the house right now? Not so much. So one of my other hands-on programs is wreaths, head crowns, and garlands, which are all the same mechanic and decide how you want to wear it or put it somewhere or hang it or on your table. It's a little difficult to squeeze in one hour. It's possible we could do a half a demi wreath. If you wanted to do the full wreath, that really kind of takes a longer time. But it is something that I, I've done a lot. It's great in the holidays, whether springtime wreath or fall wreath or Christmas wreath or anything. Okay, I think I have two more minutes. I have two newish programs. I just started doing them last year. One is Bud Vases. The other one is May Day Posies. So May Day Posies, I think it's an English or British tradition. You make little cute bouquets, small, and, and secretly leave them on the doorstep of your neighbors and your friends. So I think that is the sweetest thing. I'd like to promote it more widely. And what's kind of nice about either of these programs, you have a fairly low, relatively low supply cost. Flowers are super expensive now. This is a way to have a hands-on program. All your members can practice and, and learn design principles on a small scale, and you're not breaking the budget to be able to do that and can easily get these done in an hour. So they're, they're kind of fun and doable. My really new, new ones I'm just doing this year. One is about Constance Spry, who that was a lady in the picture with the chicken wire mechanic, <clears throat> who was kind of the Martha Stewart of her day in England in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. She was a creative, innovative floral designer. And so much of what she did was totally groundbreaking made fun of at the time, but endures to this day. Using your own homegrown, using forage materials, um, go big or go home. She made very large kind of beautiful erratic arrangements. So we talk about her and I do two demos that are Constance Spry-ish floral arrangements. And the last one is, I think it's the last one, it's about tulips. Cause I've, I've, I hope I can go over a little teeny tiny bit cause you're behind anyways. So the tulips uh, are, can be very aggravating for, for arranging with. They keep growing, they twist, they turn, they flop, they do all these different things. But I've learned a lot about different ways to grow them and how to harvest them so you can keep them for weeks, actually. Um, how to kind of bring them back to life. How to uh, have the longest vase life with them. So I talk about all these aspects of tulips that I have learned and I feel like I want to pass on. And then we will do demo of, you know, uh, of tulips in different arrangements. So those are my new programs. And again, the info is on the speakers gallery on GCM, GCFM. If you have questions or you have an idea and you wanna, you have your own idea what you'd like, can I do this for you? I totally will be happy to talk about that and adapt something for your club. 
Thank you very much. Take care. Thank, thank you, Mary. Um, are any of your programs available on Zoom? A lot of them are hands-on, but. So I can Zoom, I can Zoom any of them, even hands-on. I've done hands-on where we distribute all the material the day before and okay. we kind of do it on Zoom. Well, Lisa, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. Okay. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I am so excited to be able to um, just give you a short um, sort of um, synopsis of what I do. I'm a floral designer, and I think many of you have um, invited me in the past. I've been giving lectures since 2014. So my uh, emphasis is floral design, floral art, and I basically um, show um, in person, three designs, usually clubs love to have me for three designs, using techniques that I have learned pretty much all over the world. So it's floral art techniques that I've learned in Germany, Belgium, um, and I've also been in Thailand and Japan. I, I specifically do do European style designs, so I create structures to hold your flowers. I sort of call it designing beyond the vase. So um, I like to create structures that will hold your flowers and, and there'll be a very interesting way of presenting your flowers in, in designing. I have a website. It's uh, if you Google my name, Lisa Ober Holzer G, um, O B E R H O L Z E R dash G E, um, you'll see my website. And I think there you will see um, my design style and more information about. Um, about my lectures and testimonials. Um, I would like to also say that since COVID, I've also had the opportunity to do Zoom um, journeys. So this is what I call the floral journey, um, where I would spend half an hour with a PowerPoint um, showing you techniques that I specifically learned um, at these in these countries, Germany, Belgium, um, Thailand, Japan. And then the second part, I would actually do a live demonstration um, using that technique from that country. So there's testimonials about that as well. And um, a lot of clubs have decided whether it's winter time or they still don't feel comfortable meeting in person, that's an alternative to do the floral Zoom journey with me. So again, it's basically having fun with flowers, learning different techniques that will display your flowers using natural elements or even um, mixed media paper using tubes to hold your flowers. And, um, and I usually do it per season. So someone says, Lisa, I want to have you in November. So we would try to think about fall colors and whether it's transitioning to the holiday season, December. If you're inviting me in the spring, it would be three designs using spring flowers. So it's sort of not, um, not a theme per se, but it's more seasonal. So it depends when you invite me. If someone says, I want to do more, you know, like a, uh, um, holiday-ish, then I could do that as well. So yeah, so again, there's a lot of information on my website, Lisa Oberholtz or G, and um, testimonials, and there's a contact sheet there. So if you're interested in getting more information about what I do, please send me an email, and then we could connect and see what, what I could do for your club. Okay, I think that's, in, uh, that's it on my end. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Hi, um, good morning, good morning. We, we're finally here. I'm Mike and this is Angelina. We are co-owners of Rose Solutions, which is a landscape consulting company that specializes in roses. We do lectures, lots and lots and lots of lectures. And we used to say we would go almost anywhere to do lectures, but with the advent of Zoom, we've been everywhere throughout the United States and Canada. We also include workshops and seminars, which are longer programs where we do deep dives into rose horticulture. We're also authors of two books, Roses for New England, A Guide to Sustainable Rose Gardening, and Rose Gardening Season by Season, a journal for passionate gardeners. We publish a quarterly e-newsletter called the Northeast Rose Gardener, which we offer absolutely free. Okay. <clears throat> We're also garden writers, and we've been published in numerous magazines. We're both American Rose Society Master Rosarians, and I'm an ARS horticultural judge. So that's who we are. Let's talk about what we do. 
Six Simple Steps to Successful Rose Gardening is our most popular program, okay, <clears throat> where we will show you how to uh, grow great roses in your home gardens in six easy to follow steps. And we also include lots of anecdotes and tips from our 25 years of rose gardening experience. Another one of our programs is Roses for New England, which follows our book. And that's the first book written for New England Rose Gardeners by New England Rose Gardeners. We talk about the six steps. We tell you how to plant, prune, and when to protect your roses. And we also suggest rose varieties that do well in New England. Now, this is a program that we developed in concert with David Austin Roses and Albright in England. English roses have been popular in the United States for the last 40 years. And we met David at the Newport Flowers Show. And in 2019, we had the great good fortune to spend an entire day at Austin Roses in the UK. We, we got a personal tour of their six gorgeous, absolutely stunning display gardens. But the real magic happened when we went behind the scenes and he showed us the, where the magic occurs. It's how they develop these roses with old fashioned flower form and intoxicating fragrance. And it's all included in the program. And there's no program quite like this about English roses anywhere. Selecting Sustainable Roses is a program where we will talk about recently introduced roses as well as old favorites. And they're all disease resistant, winter hardy, easy to grow and bloom all season. We delve into the core of sustainability, explain the different grades of roses, the types of roses and their growth habits and the best varieties for your garden. Now here's a program we call Virtual Garden Tour. It's an a la carte travel program and we will take you to five gardens. The first one will be David Austin's garden in England, and then we take you to a rose garden in Rome, another one in Florence, and a beautiful rose garden right outside of Paris. We end the tour in Montreal at La Roseray, which is a rose garden at the Montreal Botanical Center, and that has 10,000 roses, and it's a day's, day's drive from New England. We could spend all morning talking about our programs, but we won't. We have 12 programs all together. They're each time for 50 minutes and we allow time for questions and answers and we'll stay as long as you like. All descriptions of all of these programs can be found at www.rosesolutions.net. Now let me leave you with a couple, of, uh, a couple of things to consider. First of all, if you need a speaker at the last minute, give us a call, contact us, maybe we can help. Uh, and secondly, any of our programs uh, will demonstrate to you how easy it is to grow great roses better than you ever thought you could. We're done. <laughs> Thank you both. <laughs> that was very good. Um, we look forward to having you at some of our meetings. Um, our next speaker is Christy Dustman. Great. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm actually driving to speak at a garden club. Uh, so I'm in my car right now, but um, really what my specialties are as a landscape designer, I've been doing this, been doing this work professionally for 24 years and I was raised by crazy uh, gardener parents, so I've been around plants my whole life. I am a plant nut is what I would describe myself as. And the programs that, that I have, that I speak on is, um, I have a strong interest in Japanese gardens. So I speak about um, what are the, what's the essence of a Japanese garden and how could we bring that to our New England gardens. Um, I talk about uh, garden objects and how to place and think about putting non-plant items in gardens. That's actually what I'm going to speak on now. Um, I talk on how does a landscape designer think? So, you know, you can read books and, but I don't know that there's really a way to, to understand how a landscape designer thinks. And that's what I try to share with people so that you may have developed some of the same sensibilities and look for the same sorts of things that I look for when I'm uh, designing. Um, 
I also am a conifer nut. So I speak on conifers, um, my passion for them, and thinking about conifers as living sculptures. So that is a pretty unusual program. Also, conifers are well adapted for climate change. So uh, I think more people, we should start thinking of them in a positive way rather than as the big blobs in front of your house. Uh, they kind of have a bad, a bad rap. Uh, and then I guess the last one that I want to mention or two is I do offer tours of my own garden in West Roxbury. So a number of garden clubs have come there. Uh, it's been on national tours as well as local tours. I do an experiential workshop uh, where I get at the essence of thinking about plants as shapes rather than, you know, where am I going to put my rose or where am I going to put my daylily? Uh, it's a very interesting hands-on uh, experience. So I would I would encourage people to think about that. It's it's probably something your club has never done. And then I also do pruning workshops. So I consider myself a master pruner. And so I really like doing experiential uh, workshops outside as well as I'm gonna do a pruning workshop inside uh, using some branches that we're gonna bring in um, so that I can showcase, you know, how I, how I again, how do you think about, what, what does a person that's pruning think about? rather than just think, you know, here are the photos of, yeah. of what somebody else has done. What's the thought process? So I think most of the feedback that I receive is that um, I have a good sense of humor and that I'm able to take what might be sophisticated or complicated concepts and explain it in a way that makes sense. So, um, that's that's me. Thank you, Christy. Christy's also been a speaker at Landscape Design Council um, School. So um, thank you again. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Tova Martin here, and I am a um, I lecture throughout New England. I'm based in Connecticut. And I especially love talking to regional garden clubs. Um, it's so much fun to link with other gardeners in my area. I can't tell you. I'm a, a best-selling author and a lecturer and a freelance writer. Um, you might have seen my byline in, in several publications. I write for many, many magazines. I'm also an honorary member of the Garden Club of America. Um, as well as um, uh, the GCA has also awarded me as for my work as an educator. Um, I'm very much a hands-on gardener. And what that means is that I am out there um, really working dirty, dirty everywhere, um, working with the soil, working in my organic garden. I have, um, I have gardens both outdoors and inside. I'm here at, at my garden that I call Furthermore in Northwestern Connecticut. I'm in the Litchfield Hills. I have seven acres of organic perennial, cottage, meadow, vegetable, informal gardens here in Connecticut. And um, this is a one woman show. I also photograph my own lectures. So I do not put up slides from the web. These are all photos of my own garden. So, um, the, uh, my um, lecture, one of my favorite lectures is a very brand new lecture and it's called In Unison, Creating Harmonious Combinations for Pollinators and You. So um, I have always been a flower child. That's what I've always been throughout my life. And um, not only does that, um, does that mean that I, you know, love flowers, but it's also great for pollinators. And I have, um, I'm so into talking to 
entomologists and other landscape and landscape designers um, to proudly present th their understandings and new understandings, as well as my own realizations from gardening day in and day out. And um, I love to do it beautifully. I love to take native plants and add them to the garden and do it very beautifully. So that is the whole thrust of in unison. This idea, this concept, that pollinator friendly gardens and eco friendly gardens can and should be beautiful. And that's so very important. Um, I have several lectures, um, but these are just my newest ones. And they really show uh, what I'm learning about pollinators and very specific, attracting very specific pollinators to gardens, but doing it beautifully, combining colors, doing it artistically. Um, doing it from the heart and making a real difference, but never losing that concept of your garden can and should be beautiful through combinations of beautiful plants. Um, so these are just a few photos. And again, these are all in my own gardens. These are all photos of plants and flowers in my own gardens. And all my lectures are this way that um, I speak from my own gardens. Um, I also have a lecture, Easiest House Plants Ever with Style. And really what I do um, there is I, I have been growing house plants my entire life. I'm not just somebody that just started with this last year or during the pandemic. Um, I've been growing house plants for decades and decades and decades. So um, when magazines like Martha Stewart's Living or Real Simple or Better Homes and Gardens needs a writer or a um, consultant about houseplants, they turn to me. And you'll find many of my articles in those magazines. So, but this, this lecture, Easiest Houseplants Ever and all my houseplant lectures photographed in my own house of my own collection of mature houseplants in a realistic setting. You won't find plants up against, you know, a, a white, seamless white background. That's not what I'm about. About how you can garden indoors realistically, doing it with plants that, um, combining plants into, and, and doing it with even average houseplants, not rare houseplants, but doing it beautifully. Again, this concept that it has to be and should be beautiful. Plant combinations, vignettes that work together, being really realistic about all my, everything that I show you and um, photographing, all my uh, photographs are professionally done. And, um, and I try to make it just really, really beautiful. So um, I would love to lecture to your group. I really would. Um, I My lectures are available live as live presentations. I also do Zoom formats. Some of my houseplant lectures are perfect for your winter lectures when you maybe can't get out. Um, and um, they're all fun and they're all filled with information. So um, please keep an eye on my website. I'm always adding lectures. I really have quite a few up. These are just two of my favorite ones that I wanted to share some, some slides of. So um, I hope to see you. That was Thank very you helpful. Lot. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Many thanks to Jill and to Lynn for organizing this program. Jill has been endlessly kind and patient in helping me make this presentation work in a timely way. I'm also extremely grateful to Lynn for her non-judgmental emails about my registration mistakes and her polite silence about my running the same ad year after year. The truth is that the content of these programs changes after every presentation. What I love about giving these talks 
is the chance to refocus each one because I learn from what my audiences, which points and images are the most helpful. Revisiting images of my travels, my landscape designs, and my installations lets me reinterpret what I've learned since my days at the Radcliffe Institute. So I can convey now what I value about these wonderful experiences. Sharing these sites and insights with you is an enormous pleasure. Now I'll give you a few glimpses of some of the programs I especially enjoy giving. Next, please. This lecture is one of my favorites because Frank Cabot is my favorite garden designer. My sons say I got all my ideas from Frank. This is almost true. My grandfather's summer place is across the bay from Frank's estate, so I've known it all my life. Here are a couple of, of visits I've taken garden clubs to. Uh, these are both Landscape Design Council trips, one in 1910 and one in 2019. Maybe you can see Jill in that picture on the right. I wish it were bigger. Next, please. Next, please. This presentation follows Frank's artfully arranged route through the gardens so we can enjoy together both the beautiful scenery and the brilliant sequencing of experiences that he so carefully organized. Viewers can also learn some design techniques that we can try at home and discover unfamiliar plants that we can grow in our own gardens. Next, please. This talk, Raised Beds and Beyond, has as a background my years of consulting with garden clubs on traffic island designs. I developed a deep respect for the valiant women who made gardens to delight their communities in impossibly difficult sites. And I also learned methods of dealing with the horrible conditions that they face. Next, please. And next. And next and next. My audience last week liked both the practical information about making and root proofing raised beds, preparing soil mixtures, and the beautiful gardens structured by carefully placed and planted raised beds. Next, please. While some gardens delight in making beautiful gardens in their front yards to share with their neighbors, others concentrate on creating private sanctuaries. They seclude themselves from the outside world with screens of trees, shrubs, and sometimes berms planted to enclose a special space and to screen unwanted views. Next, please. This was a joyful change. Uh, next, please. And this, this poor man thought that he could use those miserable little pine trees to screen the huge house that grew across the street. So we blocked it out. Next, please. The result was really pretty effective. Next, please. And I really like making berms. I learned this from Frank Cabot's berm. It's easy and it's dirt cheap. Next, please. Again, these people had to look at a school across the street. We put up a berm and it was gone in two years. 
Next, please. Shade gardening. On the left, there are two very unsuccessful gardens, which are failing to compete with the maples. And on the right is Corliss Engel's perfect garden, which I will never forget. Next, please. Focusing on peaceful green plantings is especially appealing in difficult times. Here are some unpromising areas. This one in deep shade under maple trees. Um, we basically dug a hole, fixed the drainage, put in recycled containers. Uh, and uh, next, please. Oh, well, that was premature, but never mind. We ended up with a good garden. Here's another garden where we had to import an enormous amount of soil because when we did the soil test, it turned out that we were planting on pure dynamited ledge. There was nothing there except good drainage. And within the first year of the pandemic, we were able to produce a really nice garden. Next, please. There's some of the under understory we put in, along with a lot of trees and shrubs, and we ended up with a good sanctuary. Next, Sally, please. You're, you're coming to the end of your time. I am. Yeah. Okay. One more minute. One more minute. All right. All right. Okay. okay. Yep. Uh, uses for annuals, based partly on my experience with municipal park designs and gracious garden club informal traffic island designs, we visit various types of annual plantings, plantings racing, ranging from massed annuals, which create joyous bursts of color, to using them as bright spots amongst shrubs, perennials, and vegetables. Next, please. We also look, and next, thank you. Next, last, this is it. Uh, well, can we go back to that last one? We also look at annuals as a first draft for projected perennial gardens or as a replacement for pre-existing perennial gardens ruined by invasives. So I'm going to stop there and hope that some of you will be interested in one or more of these talks. Thank you all very much. And I appreciate it. Um, my name is Stacy Lee. I am a florist. Um, I just finished up 10 years of events, um, weddings and events. I'm a sustainable florist. I focus on all American grown flowers and locally grown flowers. Um, I brought an example. These are <laughs> some beautiful anemones from Robin Hollow Farm down in um, they have a spot at Rhode Island Fresh down in Providence. Um, those were all, uh, they, had a, they had a bumper crop because both of their two sets of corms came in. So if you're looking for some anemones, they were um, buy one, get one, which is kind of nice. Um, so my focus is on sourcing American grown flowers and locally grown flowers. I work with a bunch of different, um, uh, mostly female farmers uh, around Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island to source things. Um, so my presentation is, I have two presentations and one of them is on um, sourcing sustainable flowers. Um, I'll give you all the information of where you can buy these things from like the Floral Source and Flor uh, Fern Trust and all of the different um, places that I buy from um, to get healthier flowers, flowers grown by people that you actually know, flowers grown within 100 miles of your house, um, things like that. So. Um, that is one of my absolute greatest joys. And I design with the flowers um, in front of the crew, in front of your garden club. Um, and we talk about uh, sustainable mechanics that are not floral foam. It's one of the first things that I like talking about, especially with garden club folk. Um, this is an agri wool brick. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. It's made with basalt rock. It's not a microplastic. And the cool thing with this that garden clubs like is they come out with a little plug. So you can actually um, wet this down and use it as a water mechanic, but you can actually plant right in here as a garden person and then drop it in. And if you have a particular plant that has a 
you know, a root structure that's not very firm um, or something that you don't want to disturb the roots. This is actually a great product to just help them along. Um, another one of the things that I use is the um, Ocean pouch. I don't know if any of you have seen this. This is a compostable bag with some coconut husk inside. It's made by a woman named Kirsten Van, Van, Dirk, Van Dyke. Um, and she actually lives in Sudbury. So this is something that um, she came up with. You can buy directly from their website. It's New Age Floral. You can buy both of these from the website. Um, so that's kind of my uh, sustainable floral um, uh, design demo. Um, I've worked with a couple different garden clubs and do a couple hour um, you know, presentation, make a few arrangements as per usual. Um, my other... The other um, type of program that I offer is I'm a peony farmer. So I work on um, multiple farms around, I've been to a bunch of different farms around the country. Um, I've been farming peonies um, for about 10 years. I have had peonies, I have my grandmother's peonies in my garden. So I have 60 year old peony plants um, that I have kept alive and well. Um, so if uh, you would like a booking uh, or a presentation during the month of June, it is a very quick season. It's three and a half weeks. We dry store them as well so I can get into July with peonies that are good for like events. Um, but uh, if it's about peonies, uh, my company was named Peonia Designs, which is the genus name of the peony because I'm a giant nerd and um, they are my favorite flower. So um, that's kind of what I do. Does anybody have any questions? Um, oh, I see Mary B. Hayes. I, um, we, the farm that I work at, um, we do a uh, weekend farm stand during the season and it's Nishway Peonies in Bolton and that's N-I-C-E-W-I-C-Z. And um, it's a really fun uh, fifth generation family farm. It's run by a bunch of um, four brothers that are in their 60s and 70s, a farmer, uh, Eugenia, who's in her 60s, and me. So we have a great time. It's a really fun place to be. It's a beautiful place to be. And they love having people come by um, during peony season. You can take a look at the fields and things like that. So that's kind of my spiel. Well, and, Stacey, um, thank you so much. I th um, our next speaker is Joanne Pearson. Joanne I'll give you um, a little bit of my background first, because I am a little bit different than um, most people um, here. I have been a professional photographer for over 25 years now, but prior to that, I was a landscape architect. I was registered here in the state of Massachusetts, where I practiced for 12 years. So all of my presentations, um, virtually all of the images have been photographed by me. And you have this, um, you know, it's my dual background. So whatever I'm presenting, it's like with you know, two eyes, both um, photographically and also my background as a landscape architect. The first presentation I'm going to start with is my garden design and deeper dive. And again, I bring to that um, kind of the dual background. When I think of landscape design, it's not just the plants. Planting design is just one aspect of designing your own space. So I look at first, um, I go over if you're approaching it for the first time, you want to renovate the approach, thinking about all the things that you want in your garden, um, the existing site constraints, whatever they might be, things you would like to see, uses you want. I look at some, I show you some pictures of kind of good and bad design, different aspects of gardens. Um, then I move on to sort of the inspirational part and also uh, the very educational part where we look at formal design. This is um, Chateau Villandry, which I've only been to once, unfortunately, um, but it was wonderful. So we look at the aspects, the attributes um, of whether you're doing a formal design, and informal design. So it's um, the constraints of each and the advantages of each. And you'll, I give a lot of photographic examples. Um, I move on to specific aspects of your design that you should look at because we're looking at all the elements. We're looking at the hardscape elements. And even though you're seeing this beautiful mulch path, it's a hardscape element. I talk about budget constraints, about doing um, each kind of design, um, talking about maintenance, long-term maintenance. It's huge. You can put in a gorgeous design, but how are you? Um, the cost of installing, the cost of maintaining, are you doing the work yourself? What's going to be easy to take care um, to take care of? I talk about um, vertical features, all the different ones you can use, whether they're man-made or um, whether it's conifer. Somebody else mentioned conifers. Wonderful. This is not, this isn't a spalliate, either a pear or an apple, I'm not sure which. 
um, but they can be a sculptural element. And to think about what, do, especially here in the Northeast, six months of the year, this is not what your backyard is going to look like or the entrance to your house, which this happens to be, um, not my house, unfortunately. But what are those pieces in the garden that are going to really shine also in the winter, give some life to it? Uh, we look at color, um, color and repetition and how that functions in a garden design. And this can be within your plant materials or within um, man-made elements that you're using that carries your eye and you and your guests who are in your yard, kind of through your yard, all, all those connections. Uh, my next presentation is fragrance in the garden. And this one is plant specific, but we do, I do start off with you know the fragrance in the garden, that wonderful fragrance that we get to enjoy botanically and physiologically, it's not there so we can enjoy it. Um, it's there to protect the um, plants, to promote their life, to uh, promote their survival. And there are some fascinating ways um, that plants are able to do this through the VOCs, the scent that they put out. I talked briefly about plant classification botanical names because you can make the mistake, and I am guilty of doing this. If you don't know, and I should know better, if you go, you have an idea of what plant you want to use, and you don't know the botanical name, you only know one of the many common names for it, you can end up buying the wrong plant and be very disappointed when it starts growing. Then we look at very specifics of trees with um, fragrant blooms, shrubs, flowers, perennials, and annuals, and herbs. And we look at maybe places you haven't thought of to have these, um, whether you're in urban, whether um, you're in a rural place where you can really appreciate the fragrance kind of from first thing in the morning till maybe even when you're going to bed at night. And of course, bringing some of these plants, these fragrant flowers inside your house. This is actually, I'm sitting at this table right now. Then I have a Gorgeous Gardens of New England series. Currently, I have four um, in this presentation. I'll be adding a couple of more, including a Gorgeous Gardens a little bit beyond. I was in the Hudson River Valley last summer and also in northern New Jersey. I do try to get to the gardens at least twice um, that I before I put them in the presentations. Uh, this map is actually, I create one for each of the presentations for a Zoom presentation. I send this as a PDF to my um, organizer from each garden club so they can disseminate them to everybody who's going to be in attendance in Zoom. Or if it's an in-person presentation, I actually make copies and hand this out to um, everybody there. So before I start each segment, there are usually 10 to 12 gardens in each presentation. There's a screen that comes up so you can locate on the map um, which garden we're looking at. And I do these presentations, mostly they're, they're visually gorgeous. In the middle of winter, to me, there's nothing nicer than looking at gorgeous gardens, but they're very inspirational. Um, you might find ideas of both maybe places you want to travel to to see these gardens yourself, or you're inspired by something you've seen that you might want to take some of that design and use it in your garden. I talk about in these presentations, I talk about design, I talk about the history of if they're a part of estate houses, uh, the development, and I want to impress that we're, we're part of the continuum of how gardens and landscape design has changed over the years. Um, I also include this map for Bedrock Gardens is actually on their website, but it's to give you an idea of this is a very small garden. Um, this one, Bedrock is not. Um, you have to do a lot of walking in Bedrock, so to kind of orient you. I always find I'm, in some ways, I'm kind of surprised. Um, there are gardens that I present that people have been to and aware of, and there are so many gardens that people are not aware of. And some of them are my secret gardens, like I consider this one, which I'm not going to divulge the location this one to you right now. Um, it's one of the ones that most people aren't even aware exist. And again, I have an emphasis on overall design, garden design, and um, plants in this presentation. And I touch on some of my um, photography techniques that I use. I also include some historic um, images so that you get a real feel for what a particular garden might have looked like 100 years ago. This is the most wonderful blue stairs at Namki, the design sketches for it um, by Fletcher Steele. Um, this one is the Blue Garden, which I will be adding in. I got to go to it two times um, last summer. And the last presentation is creating beautiful garden photographs. Um, 
although I'm not, I'm a terrible iPhone photographer because I don't care about iPhone photography because I've always been a shooter with 35 millimeter. But there are techniques I can teach people, everyone, no matter what you're using, how to, how to take better photographs. And there are so many things that, to me, I think of them as being instinctual, but they're not. As my sister pointed out many years ago, I learned these different techniques. Um, and now I just do them, whether it's composition, it's the time of day when I know I want to be at a place to shoot. It's moving around um, what I'm taking so I get that kind of nice balance or asymmetrical balance. I do talk tech talk also in this, um, but there's so much that you can learn from this presentation on just how to approach landscape photography, garden photography, again, no matter what you're using for a camera. And I'm here, okay, just got a few more. Yeah, Joanne, you're running, you're running to the end yep. of your time. Oh, there I am. this is the end, my contact. <laughs> Um, I do have just sort of a housekeeping note. I welcome you to go to my website. Don't be shocked because as a photographer, I shoot for inns and resorts um, in the Northeast. I do their interiors, exteriors, or landscapes, all that. So you're, but I do have a section on lectures, a section on gardens. And if you go to the contact section, for some reason, some people have had problems if they click on the link that, you know, that is on the contact page of my website, they click on it and it's like a dead link. I don't know why that is, nor does my web designer, but you're very safe if you just put in the, you know, two line, if you're sending me an email, the joanne at joannepearson.com, I get it. And please, uh, my phone numbers are in there. And please also, if you're emailing me, include your um, phone number. So in the future as we're making plans. I'm now and I'm... Um, Sorry. You <laughs> Okay, that's it. Sorry, Joanne. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. There we go. Thanks. Um, thanks so much to everyone who's here. And um, what a great collection of speakers. Yeah, it was amazing. I want to come to all of your talks. Um, I have a couple of slides to share, and I'm glad to see so many familiar names and faces. Um, I'm Michelle Frank Schuckel. I'm a certified master gardener. I'm also a nurse, and I work in public health. And um, those of you who have had me out here at clubs before have heard me say I used to kind of separate the left brain, right brain of garden design and native plants um, that I've been doing for about 18 years now from my work in healthcare. And um, just before the pandemic, the two sort of came together in my head and I realized mostly what I'm talking about and what fuels me is, is our wellness, our collective wellness in the garden, um, in society, in our own homes, in our families, um, with our friendships, and of course the connections that we make in our garden clubs, which are so important to us. So I have a really, um, I would guess, a atypical collection of, of um, talks and uh, programs. Um, slides. There we go. Um, for lectures, I'm um, kind of all over the map. I do a conversation about the well-traveled bloom, um, not the locally sourced flowers that Stacy um, so kindly talked about, which sounds um, amazing and um, is um, an industry obviously increasing in the area, which is awesome. Um, more about those flowers that come from far away and um, the journey they take, which um, is something I kind of got into looking at more closely as I worked through trying to find locally sourced flowers for Art and Bloom uh, when I designed last year. Um, I talk about gardening and a changing climate, uh, what that means for us. We talk about sort of the big parts of climate change and um, and really what we can each do to make a difference. Um, so it's kind of an empowering idea and some of that can start for all of us in the garden and in our floral design. Um, I very much marry my time in the garden with um, my time as a healthcare practitioner and the next talk, Mindfulness and the Aging Gardener. Um, and certainly working in the garden and working with plants is a perfect opportunity to center ourselves and talk about um, our, our, our wellness and um, being present in what we're doing. Um, the um, insecurity that the pandemic um, revealed around food sources for so many in Massachusetts and beyond um, was really the, the um, idea uh, that spurred on the field to fork conversation where we talk about the horticulture of the food we eat. Um, where things come from, and um, again, what we can do to make a difference and how we think about our food systems. Um, native Plants Natural Selections, um, spinning off the name of my design business, is um, really about survival of the fittest, what we can do for native plants 
um, in our yards. And I've been working with native plants and design um, since they, before they were hip, I suppose. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a fun exploration of, of how you all can then learn to think about bringing natives into your own gardens. Um, winter in the yard is a great off-season conversation uh, because the quiet season for us as gardeners is really anything but um, under the soil. So we'll talk about what's going on. Um, I do um, and a weed ID conversation. And actually both of these are topics that actually came out of club interest, folks that asked for certain things. And um, I've spun those into ones that I offer to others. Um, I know that certain clubs like to do demonstrations and workshops, um, that um, some of us coming to talk at you is not always uh, the most exciting thing and you need to break up your program year. So I offer a bunch of different things here, um, celebrating the everyday with easy centerpieces, using like grocery store or easy to obtain flowers or things you cut from your own yard in combination with things that you found around your home to create some fun um, on your kitchen counter or for um, a little celebration that we're happy to be able to have again now that we're coming to the end of this um, terrible three years that have been so hard for so many of us. Um, I talk about composting and the coolest kind of recycling um, in a composting talk. It's a really how-to. I'll bring samples of, of composting at all stages from like the food scraps to the final result and talk about how to make your own or how to use the uh, municipal systems that are more and more available to us in our towns. Uh, the botany of beverages is super fun. This is an exploration into all things uh, drinks, um, steering mostly clear of wine and beer, but talking about other spirits, and also the use of herbs and creating um, simple syrups and the sort of shrub type beverage. So um, while I'm not a bartender, I can either provide the um, bases for mixers um, for, for drinks, and you can actually make this like a cocktail kind of evening, um, or certainly go the other way, which is a whole new realm these days, into um, health and uh, talk about non-alcoholic drinks but using herbs and other things that um, we know about all things horticulture. Um, and then a couple more winter blooms. We talk about armrails and paper whites, and this can be a demonstration with um, a number of giveaways for your club, or um, we could do a workshop as well. Um, I haul lots of materials and soil and plants and all sorts of things for Yankee containers um, for sun and shade, uh, where we talk about using perennials and containers, um, in addition to herbs and um, veggies and other edibles. And um, we can do reeds and swags um, or some kind of combination of seasonal items, which of course is popular always um, in November and December. Um, I'd love to hear from you to learn um, what you're looking for and to answer any questions you have. I do Zoom and in-person talks um, or the hybrid combo. Um, actually doing one tonight for Natick. So if you're in the area, it's at the Natick Library. You can um, look that up online if you wanna come see, see me in action if you're in the Metro West area. Um, I know opportunity drawings are great for folks and I can um, make those happen. I've got lots of experience. I'll do day or evening, happy to travel. And um, all my contact info is up on the screen and I also dropped it in the chat. So if anybody has any questions, I would um, welcome hearing from you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Michelle. Okay, so my name is Betsy Simzak and I primarily talk about begonias and dahlias and I've started talking about some other things. I kind of got into this garden lecture thing by my love of these two types of plants, but I'm doing some other things. Uh, I'm a National Garden Club garden consultant, a Massachusetts master gardener. Uh, I'm a member of the American Begonia Society. I'm an uh, ABS uh, judging co-chair. I taught uh, begonia judging at the Philly Flower Show last weekend. I'm a member of a bunch of Dia Society, the Dia Society judge, and a just Nereid um, Society member. So my programs uh, each consist of 45 to 60 minute interactive PowerPoint presentation, a two page resource handout for each attendee. That is also made available for the club to post on their website or to send to someone who couldn't make it. Um, I do in-person lectures, and when I do, I always bring uh, a lot of demonstration material, and everybody loves an opportunity, so when I do a Dahlia lecture at this time of year, I bring tubers. Uh, a little later on in the year, I'll bring cuttings, and then in the fall, I'll bring bouquets. When I do a begonia lecture, I will bring uh, three to five plants to give away or to whatever your club wants to do. I uh, have a Zoom account and I can serve as a Zoom host. 
and I am willing to go to a morning or afternoon uh, uh, lecture. Um, so my begonia talks, uh, this is a begonia art hods and this is um, begonia peltata. I enjoy growing species begonias from exotic places and hybrid begonias that you can buy at Russell's. Um, my begonia programs are begonia for any season. This covers the four seasons. I talk about annual uh, bedding begonias and then I get into more houseplant kinds of begonias. I have a program called Fancy Leaved Begonias, but what about the flowers? And this is where we talk more specifically about begonias as houseplants. I can also talk about how to grow and show a blue ribbon begonia, what judges look for, how to enter a begonia show. Uh, that again is my begonia art hods. Uh, this is a species begonia from Vietnam that's very tiny and very cute. Betsy, uh, and I hate are, to interrupt you, but you haven't got your, you didn't put your, your presentation up. I didn't realize you had one. Oh, <laughs> man, you'd think I knew how to do this. <laughs> well, that's all right. I've had my own problems today, so I understand. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Uh, I've got to uh, start video. There you go. Now I've got to do this. This is very embarrassing. <laughs> All right, so that's, uh, those are my slides. That's about me. These are my programs, the particulars, Art Hods and Begonia Pultata, my three Begonia talks, another Begonia. The Dahlia pictures are better than the Begonias. Uh, this, is a, this is called Begonia Buttercup, which is an African hybrid and makes these gorgeous just little yellow flowers in a terrarium in the winter. Okay, so my dahlia presentations, uh, I have a general gardening with dahlia uh, where I cover everything you need to know about dahlias in 60 minutes, and that's really um, uh, uh, too much. So I have broken it down and some clubs have invited me to do my dahlias in winter, what to do. And you might think, what do you do about dahlias in winter? You can't grow them, but there's a lot you can do to get ready what to do in spring, summer and fall, how to dig, how to store, how to divide dahlias. That is my dahlia garden um, um, on October 14th, 2020. So dahlias you grow because of that. Uh, I recently started a plant propagation uh, program. I gave it a couple of weeks ago. This is actually a wedge cutting of a dahlia, uh, of, a, of a begonia called Wanda McNair. Some of you may know Wanda McNair was a premier begonia grower. She recently passed away and this begonia is named after her. I talk about vegetative propagation. This is not a dahlia, nor is it a begonia, but an echeveria, but this is the mom and this is the baby. Uh, these are the uh, handouts that I use. I'm a very hands-on person. I will teach you how to how to make a better dahlia, how to grow a better begonia, how not to kill your dahlias and your begonias. Uh, a couple of years ago, my garden club was interested in a program that was gonna be cheap and quick. And if it was gonna snow, could we do it on Zoom? And I went to the White House in 2016 and took a lot of pictures, which I didn't realize were as nice as they were. And that was a little holiday program. I did it for the Bourne Garden Club last December during their luncheon, they liked it. Those are some of the pictures and that's it. And I'm very sorry about the screen sharing issue. My contact information can be found uh, on the GCM, GCFM website and there'll be an ad in the book. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Kristen Torkelson. Who's been Hi, can you? Hi, um, I'm also a photographer and I got to, Kind of, um, I had a good friend who liked all my pictures who talked me into giving a um, garden club presentation. And that brought me in since I believe 2018, I've been a um, Federated Garden Club um, speaker. So um, one of my favorite um, shows, I'll be putting up a presentation in a minute, is taking um, how to take a better photo no matter what camera you're using, whether you're using, okay, the, the lovely cell phone, which you cannot see or um, a digital SLR. So let me start my presentation. 
Okay, so what um, I have two different types of programs. Um, the first um, group is um, good for Zoom if you um, if you would prefer, and that includes a tour of Magic Wings, um, which is a blood butterfly conservatory in Deerfield, um, in Western Mass, and um, I go over how to take. Um, butterfly photographs and um, give people an overall tour. So for the people who aren't necessarily interested in um, taking um, photographs of the, um, but, you know, taking photographs themselves, they still have a nice respite of what's going on. Um, I also have a um, tour of the Birmingham Botanical Gar Gardens in Alabama. And then, um, my husband is from Delaware, which is um, right next to Longwood Gardens in um, Maryland. So um, I've been there several times and I can give a nice history along with um, some slideshows. Um, one, of my one of the favorites I have is the um, history of the Bridge of Flowers, um, where I go through and I show um, how they turn um, this old trolley bridge into a um, world premiere garden. So, um, so all of those are available via Zoom. Um, then um, my favorite and what a lot of people like are either the, um, the lecture um, demo of how to give a better photograph no matter what kind of camera you're using. And I'm going more over a perspective angle and the thought process beside, behind, sorry, behind taking your photograph. So if you know why you're taking your photograph, you'll take a little bit better image. So you go in, I go into ankle perspective and things like that. So my programs um, in person for a demo usually involves um, a brief intro, um, a small slideshow just to show people um, some of the good pictures I take. And then I go through and show them images of all the things that you can do wrong or how, you know, how to change things up to make them better. Um, and then um, I break it up at the end where I do a, um, it's called um, Name the Flower um, little competition, or, you know, just exercise where I show, um, I don't actually do 10 anymore. I do like five or six images of um, flowers from, from the presentation. And then the club members go through, um, the list of options on the bottom and um, either write it in or they write the number one, two or three next to it. And then we go through and we grade them. And then um, this um, answer sheet is actually um, a, basically a raffle ticket. So everybody who gets them, they self-grade, everybody who gets them all right, um, I'll bring a selection of my photographs, either um, magnets or um, pictures or um, Christmas ornaments. Um, that they can select for as a grab prize. So um, these are some of the selections of the photographs that um, I take from the Bridge of Flowers. And um, that's in Shelburne Falls, if any, but uh, Western Mass. My um, niece lives um, a, less than a quarter mile away. So it gives me nice access. So um, if you can't guess, I like to take up close up pictures of flowers and they're little companions. And so um, here is um, a copy of the ad that you'll be seeing um, on the um, web, uh, on the Federated Garden Club website. And um, the website will be coming soon. Unfortunately, I had um, some family health emergencies, so I wasn't able to um, get it up before the before today, but I hope to have it up by the, um, by the end of next week. Anybody have any questions? Oh, I wanted to mention that um, if you have any questions, you can um, talk to Pox at Hingham, Needham, Garden Clubs of um, Concord. Um, one of the um, options we did for the Bridge of Flowers, I do a demo in which we actually, um, I did a small lecture in one of their um, garden club um, gardens who was also master gardener. And then, um, so I gave the thing and then we um, went around and took pictures. Um, I also have a workshop available for inside um, where I bring um, a bunch of flowers that are donated by a local florist with different setups to, um, to give you different, 
allow you to um, practice the tips I give um, during the presentation and you go home with a tip sheet. Um, and I do that for the tips work for either. Um, I have ones that are general and then I have ones that are specific for phones versus um, and then the DSLRs. And that's about what I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Maria von Brinken, have you on my list next? Hi, okay. It took me a second to get the screen up. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm really glad to be here and thanks for hanging out this long. It's a, it's a beautiful sunny day and, you know, we're so glad it's out. The sun's out, the snow's melting, and I know we're all dreaming about spring and flowers. Um, now I'm an experienced garden designer over 30 years, certified in a number of ways, and, and, but I'm also a very passionate gardener. And, and on the top of my mind right now is the, you know, we have a lot of new terms that are bombarding us all the time, rewilding, natural gardens, naturalistic gardens, native plant gardens, all these to name a few, pollinator gardens. And uh, a recent blog I wrote was all about how wild do you want to get? You know, walking on the wild side in your gardening. Um, so even though um, what I've been finding is I've been presenting um, my lectures on different topics, um, like color gardens, um, um, you know, beautiful perennial combinations from spring through frost is one. Expand your bloom with flowering trees and shrubs. Um, creating the winter garden and beyond using the layout of landscape design. Um, and of course, the one I'm gonna to showcase today is uh, creating an ornamental wildflower pollinator meadow garden. Um, but all in all my presentations, I'm I always have native plants anyway, and so I'm talking when I show different slides. I now actually talk about you know concepts of how you might bring in these ideas of uh, how to create a more natural landscape. Um, the I think I've covered that. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to share the screen, and and showcase this one uh, um, top of the mind topic. Uh, here we go. Okay. Now you should be seeing a slide that says creating an ornamental wildflower pollinator meadow garden. Does everyone see that? That's now we see, it okay. um, doesn't look like it's open to that PowerPoint yet. Okay, well, let's see. I shared it, but let's try it again. How's this? Yep, yep, we got it. Okay, so one of the things I should note is that all my lectures have very detailed handouts. Whether I'm presenting a Zoom lecture, which I hardly suggest that you consider me for the especially months of January and February where the weather's awful and half the clubs are traveling, consider me for a Zoom lecture then. And I do a few in-person lectures, but they're pretty close to home. They all surround the Sudbury area. But if you, uh, some clubs are actually, you know, they have been booking me for those prime winter months. And, but also the idea of some members are gathering at a member's home and using the their flat screen, you know, smart TVs and doing these kind of mini little meetings. So that's another thing to think about. So um, on to creating, let me just show you the, um, of course I'm a certified landscape designer and you can reach me at my website, mariavonbrinken.com. Under my lectures, you'll have a list of lectures and, and a um, lecture description handout you can download and my email address, which is mvonbrinkenlgd at gmail.com, which is different from previous years. So, you know, I talk about different kinds of, of wild places. Field meadows um, is, you know, is one that, you know, we kind of, this is the wayside in, we're used to it. 
But then, you know, we might want to think about um, what I call my ornamental pollinator uh, garden. And this is a garden I designed a few years ago. And I start to show you and talk about the design concepts and plants. And of course, I'm using these plants. This is a fairly large size, but I also uh, talk about how you can adapt this wild garden to a smaller scale. So you see it through the seasons. And this is from with advantage of the more ornamental, but still, you know, a lot of the the plants from a, a you know native plants. And then I talk about how to do this. I talk about layout design and the cornerstone of that and interlocking perennial drifts. And any of you who maybe have seen uh, Piet, um, oh gee, what's his last name? I was thinking about I'm talking about Miss Piet. He designs in this way. I came to it my own way, but recently I've been it all it. off. Thank you. I've been looking at his stuff and I said, oh, we do it the same way. Ah. So I teach you this. And um, and then I talk about in sequence. Now, of course, this is not a, a native, so this is a non-native, but we don't have a lot going on in our neck of the woods. So we use things like some of these non-natives in the early months. Um, but then we can go to the, the natives and think about what our pollinators are, which are more than um, a lot of us think about pollinators in terms of butterflies, but they're also beetles and flies and bees and wops and hummingbirds, of course. But these are bird things that birds eat in the, in the spring um, to, to feed their baby birds, and it actually helps the bird population. So they're really important in that measure. Um, you know, lupins, and of course, I talk about these borders um, that are in bloom earlier. That was a way to, to have uh, something going on in these gardens. And again, how these play out, what they look like. Um, and I talk about color palettes, which are important in any kind of garden, explain the, some of the basic complementary color ideas with adjacent colors and how they work. Um, and continue with these plans. And again, all of this information is on your handouts, so you can refer to them anytime during the lecture, next year, next week. And so a lot of these plans are really fun and create a very dynamic design um, throughout the seasons. So in this lecture, as you can see, um, after showing you all the, the plants, I go back to what I call the inspiration photos, you know, to show you what it looks like when you mix all these grasses in at different parts of the season and how it can work um, so that you have, you know, you can have your dream if it's a wild garden. And again, all of these concepts can, can um, apply to a more ornament, you know, more, more cultivated garden. Uh, less wild, like something like this border that you see, but yet it still has, you know, native plants in here. Um, and, you know, have fun making your own garden. That's my attitude for everything that I show and, and teach. When I teach these techniques to how to use color, um, how to do planting layout, um, how to create a winter design, that works um, in the winter, but also becomes um, a structure that makes your house look good and then becomes a backdrop in the rest of the months for whatever plants are in bloom at that time. Um, Maria, I'm so Finish up. Yeah, I'd love to talk to your club. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Um, Deborah Chud, you are our next speaker. I am here, hello. Hello, I'm Deborah Chud. And this year, I'm offering three different Zoom programs starring new perennials, the genre of plants introduced during the new perennial movement. New Perennials, a love story, formerly called a Pete Outolf story, is an introduction to the design principles of Pete Outolf, who was just mentioned, a founder of the new perennial movement and the world's leading naturalistic landscape designer. Part one covers my five years of research on him. 
which culminated in a unique database of his plant combinations and the transformation of my garden from this to this. Part two describes the historical context in which Adolf emerged as a landscape designer. And part three presents his design concepts, including his approach to structure and the special balance he achieves between coherence and contrast via certain rules for combining structure and color. In Not Your Mother's Garden, I take the audience on a photo tour of my own Pete Adolf style garden. And I describe the design principles underlying it. Many of the plants are unfamiliar, even to experienced and knowledgeable gardeners. These new perennials were all taken from Adolf's canon of plants, and they exhibit the qualities valued by the new perennialists. So what's new about new perennials and what can they do for you? Walk through my garden with me to find out. My Design Dilemma workshops are all about members' gardens. People submit photos of their dilemmas, from which I select those of greatest educational value to everyone, not just the submitters. I respond with a PowerPoint, <clears throat> excuse me, of solutions grounded in Pete Adolf's design principles, which I present at a club meeting. Here are a few highlights from previous workshops. The plants are new perennials from Adolf's canon arranged in his style. Help, there are monsters in my bed. Refer to the dead Japanese maple on the left and the symbiotic pair next to it, a gnarly old hydrangea conjoined with a stunted azalea. In my solution, I dispatched the monsters and filled the bed with plants that would bloom from April through November and leave structural seed heads that would extend the season through midwinter. I populated what this submitter called her ugly side yard with an elegant tree-like shrub presiding over an array of structural plants unified by repeated grasses. This traditional garden's makeover included grasses and perennials that would contribute naturalistic softness, structure and texture, movement and light play, surprise and spontaneity, and considerable winter interest. Each submitter receives a tangible takeaway, a personal PDF guide to a reimagined garden, equivalent to a multi-hour consultation. I doubt your members will have another opportunity quite like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. Mm -hmm. Okay, our last speaker is Diane Edgecombe, who's waited very patiently. Thank you very much, everyone, for those of you who are still here, including me. And it's just been inspiring to see everyone's uh, garden club presentations. I'm a little bit different. I am a professional storyteller. I'm a performer. I come to the Garden Club along with my Celtic Harper, Margot Chamberlain, and I have been researching stories and songs that celebrate flowering plants and the seasons for over 30 years. And this is a full out performance. Oftentimes, a Garden Clubs will bring it, and I'm going to share screen right now so you can just see my, my web page. Um, and I'm going to also put in the chat my info. Um, here we go. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Is that possible? You can see my, my page here? Yep. Anyone? Yep, yes. you're all good. Okay. You're all good. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I so remembered on myself. Okay, it's livingmyth.com gardens. And uh, so uh, these are full out entertainments. Um, you're going to see some video also where um, we're in a theatrical environment, but um, I have been storytelling for over 30 years. I perform everywhere and the performances are indoors and um, they're often events that are done as larger events at the Garden Club. People will invite their spouses. They'll do it in combination with a library for the community. And uh, so it's, it's done in that way. So I have three performances. Uh, that I uh, toured to garden clubs. One is Fantastical Folk Tales of Flowers, and uh, that's just as it sounds. The other one is Sacred Groves, which is about tree myths and songs, and I'll play you a little bit of that. And the other one is the Winter Solstice, which celebrates the flower uh, uh, Helleborus Niger, the Christmas Rose, and also the mistletoe. I And I have Midsummer Magic 
uh, as well. But I also do a sharing tales workshop, um, which it can be done via Zoom or, or live. And all these things can be done Zoom, Zoom hybrid or live. So I am going to just show you a little bit of video. Again, remember that although it's in a theater environment with a slide, uh, when I do garden clubs, I tend not to do the slide background because I really want to bring you into the live performance and have your imaginations uh, really going with it. So don't be distracted by that. So here's a little bit of, ah, <laughs> no. Here's a little bit of uh, fantastical folk tales of flowers. So we do songs that are related to uh, the season and celebration of flowers. This is fantastical folk tales of flowers. And I do feel like, and I know from my own experience, that when you hear the story of a flower, um, it really, when you go then to work in the garden, as I'm saying here, it accompanies it like a new perfume. like a meditation on the flower. So I sometimes think when I know the story of a flower, it kind of surrounds it like a new perfume when I'm working in the garden. And I uh, can't the really hear you. Oh, you can't hear it. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, um, fact, I'm not sure why that is. Um, I do travel with a state-of-the-art sound system. So when I am there, you will definitely be able to hear me. Okay, let me show you a different... Um, the slide then. I mean, excuse me, not slide, the different video, but they're, uh, I'm afraid they're going to have the same uh, issue here. This is going to be um, Sacred Groves. Um, and this is a song from Russia about the birch tree. And I companion that with a Yakut folktale, which speaks about the world tree and how every tree kind of symbolizes this world tree that is the axis. Be pleasant. Sometimes there was incredible wind and rain, and little by little, people started drifting away. This is an Australian Aborigine story. Some among them were complaining. Do we really have to get up? This is the Japanese story of the cherry tree. Han Sakura, sacred cherry tree. And I'm going to show you another uh, one from the winter solstice. Again, I apologize. I, I saw that the sound was going to be a little bit low. Extra strength mistletoe. You know, it's actually hard to find these days, but I discovered something new. You can get it at mistletoe.com. Right. right on the way to the North Pole. So the winter solstice performance also has been a very popular celebration. Again, I have these three different performances that really line up with flowering plants. And uh, although I travel with Margot Chamberlain, sometimes uh, Tom Megan also comes as well. <laughs> so I want to um, just uh, show you one more time my, let's stop that right there. So you one more time, my web page. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I tour around with a state-of-the-art sound system. Again, it's, it's sometimes seen as a community event where you can invite uh, people to your garden club spouses or sometimes presidential teas it's been at and this web page livingmyth.com gardens um, at my livingmyth.com site has all the different shows so thank you so much everyone for waiting till the end <laughs> of this time to see me play my video and um, talk to you a little bit
Thank you so much, Diane. Um, and thank you all for your patience today. Um, you know, as, as several people have said, sometimes technology gets away from you. Um, we will be, as I said, sending out information on all the speakers. Um, please check out the website because there are advertisements. And um, as soon as the video from today's um, Zoom is ready, it will be posted on the website, on the page with the program advertisers. So we'll let you know when that's available. Um, again, thank you all and um, look forward to seeing you at more programs in the near future. <laughs>